today's passage is taken from James chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, Here's a good seat for you. But say to the poor man, You stand there, or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. This is the word of the Lord. May God add a blessing to his word. Right, this morning, uh, well, uh, the sermon is so long, I have to break into two parts. So, following Arnold's uh, example, we will preach again on the same topic next week. So, uh, um, get ready for that. And uh, William Nyao from the Brethren Church will be preaching to us, starting our series on 1 John, the joy and the knowledge of God. And after that, uh, our own uh, associate elder John Lee will be de dealing with the enemy within uh, John chapter 1, verse 5 to 10. Today's topic is basically uh, knowing the heart of God, why he chooses the poor. Is, is, is God uh, partial to the poor? And then if you drive here with your Lexus, uh -huh, God looks at you and says, you know, what, what, what's the whole deal? Because it seems to be favoring the poor here. So what is the whole issue here? Uh, we are starting off our Gamma series on, on the James. So please join us. The, 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 the whole thrust of the discipleship program is a faith that really works. Knowing God in adversity, understanding temptation, the Christian in the world, true spirituality, slandering and judging. Wow, that, that's a very important topic close to all our hearts. Uh, planning and worry, materialism, patience, uh, praying for the sick, spiritual restoration. So if you're interested in any of these topics, please join our Gamma groups. They've already started on Wednesday, March 2nd onwards. Contact the church office for more details. Right, so let's start with a word of prayer. Father, Lord, we ask this morning that you open up our hearts to understand your heart why your heart beats for the poor in our midst, why your heart beats for the refugee, why your heart beats for so many people whom we don't usually consider in our lives. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. We look at the passage today. I'm going to just deal with seven verses today, and then next I'll deal with all the other verses. So if you look at the passage, there, the main point is the biblical principle which he sets forth. The principle is partiality. Then he gives an example, and then he gives you the reasoning why the principle should be upheld, and the reasoning will go on to next week as well, all the way to chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. All right, so four points I would like to make this morning. One, true faith has no place for partiality. Two, the basis of partiality is judgment. Three, we're neither qualified nor entitled to judge. Number four, we need to see ourselves in the light of Christ. So faith, true faith has no place for partiality. See, here he's addressing a situation in the church. It's specific. 
And a lot of people misinterpret James because they don't understand that this is the occasional letter. He's writing the letter to them because they were experiencing certain problems in the church. And so they hear is a command, show no partiality. All right, the word is a very funny word. It's not found in secular Greek or even the Greek Old Testament. It's a direct translation from the Hebrew term favoritism. So if your Bible verse just now who read the translation, favoritism is actually spot on. All right, so favoritism actually in the Old Testament has the background has either positive or negative. Negative means you, you discriminate against someone. Positive means you give somebody reward and others you don't. There are two facets of that. Now, the background is the book of Judges, for example, the, the Leviticus about Old Testament judges. You shall not do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. So a judge doesn't look at whether you're poor and give you a hand on your rich and then press you down. He is impartial. That is the background of judges. And that's the character of God. For the Lord your God is God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great and mighty, awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow. He loves the sojourner and gives him food and clothing. So our behavior should be based on God's character as judge. Judges exercise social justice. And Paul, when he looks at other people, he's not intimidated by other apostles. You see, he wasn't part of the twelve. And yet, God spoke to him, brought him to Christ separately. And when he joined them, he might have felt intimidated. These were, wow, twelve apostles, and I'm number thirteen. So, he said, oh my God. And then, from those who seem to be influential, ah, you see, come and see, oh, this one, all like elder, I'm like nobody. No, he didn't say that. They make no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seem influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when Saul was entrusted with the gospel to, to the uncircumcised, as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. So therefore, that's how he views people on a flat plane. So today is the sin of the ashes. How many of you have been ushers? Yeah, okay, let's hope that we are not guilty of this. So, so what, what does the usher do? The usher sees someone come into church and they drive a Lexus and then they flash like that, you know, ho, 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 you know. And then automatically you bring him here, sit next to Arnold Lim, and within spitting distance, right, that's not a good place to sit. <laughs> In fact, the best seats are at the back. <laughs> That's why you see me sitting there near the Makan place. <laughs> so it's preferential treatment, isn't it? And, and, and the, the thing that's here is that they put the rich person in a good place uh, and the poor person sit at my feet, which is basically derogatory. Looking down on him, putting him in a place that has got no honour. Is this about equality? Are, you know, are the communists correct? We should actually treat everybody equally, right? Is that right? Well, what about here, the French Revolution, the Cultural Revolution of China, there was a great upswell among the average ordinary people that why should these people be treated better than us, the nobility, the kings? We will all be on the flat plane, so they go and chop everybody's head off uh, in both those revolutions. But if you look in Proverbs, my son feared the Lord and the king. Do not join with those who do otherwise. 1 Peter chapter 2, live as people who are free, not as using your freedom as a cover for evil, but living as servants of God. Honour everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honour the emperor. So, rulers have a special place. Are they not human beings? But they are treated a little bit differently. So, Anwar goes up there, goes to the king. He doesn't go in jeans, right? He doesn't simply say things. He has to bow. There's some things and every, all the dignitaries are there. So, this is an acknowledgement of inherent dignity. What about older people? Do not rebuke an older people, older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older men as older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, all impurity. So there is decorum within the culture. We have culturally appropriate expressions of respect to different people. In Paul's time, the women would have come to church and they would wear a veil or a head covering. And in some societies in the world, there is that, but 
that is a culturally appropriate expression of dignity for them, in no way does Paul say they're inferior, therefore they have to wear the veil, because he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, nevertheless, in the Lord, the woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman, for just as a woman was made from man, a man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. He's very, very clear. Whenever he forms a distinction, he always counters it by saying there's equality because God created man in his own image, the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So the basis of our treating people is basically the true faith has no place for partiality. And the basis of partiality is judgment. If you look, this part is the example that he gives us. Now, you, he, verse 4, Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So when the usher asked the poor person to sit in a horrible place, he has actually become a judge. And only one person who should be a judge. And that's God. So you're actually usurping his role. Not only usurping his role, you are actually judging through externalities. Just because you wear a golden ring and a big 24 karat diamond come here, how do you know the Lord didn't steal the money from, from your EPF? <laughs> Alama, if I knew that the diamond ring was uh, you know, stolen from my EPF money, right? I'm not going to get you sit here, you sit at the back. You don't know. So what you're doing is that we're judging people from what we can see, isn't it? And that's a whole problem of discrimination. Partiality, discrimination is unfair, prejudicial treatment of people and groups based on race, gender, sexual orientation. And this sermon goes beyond poverty. It goes to racism. It goes to classism. All sorts of things that we discriminate against. If you go to Western country, you will see the most important people are what? On the top, tall, white, good-looking men. Average white man, number two. Asians, number three. Oh, my son is in Australia, big problem. <laughs> Say, why, father, uh, all the white men top us, China men, eh, below the China woman, actually. <laughs> the Asian women seem to get jobs easier in Australia than the Asian men. Right? So, but you choose to go there. <laughs> That's your problem. If you go to Hong Kong, ha! This is the study in Hong Kong. Chinese, number one. White man number two, right? So, so we all have these prejudices because it's all built in. This is one of the biggest races around. <laughs> he left the Pejuang Party and found, uh, he founded and picks GTA as a new political platform. And they, they say, call me racist, but the Malays, same song, you know, he's been singing for 30 years, are now left behind, uh, giving way to the foreigners. I wonder who he means. Foreigners. Must be the Zo people, right? <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> in 97, so, so if society is made out of this pecking order, we all got to put on a mask to look bigger than what we actually are because we actually tend to judge each other. I was watching this very funny show called Married at First Sight. I think it's a good show to watch, especially those who want to get married. I mean, they sleep together, that part you ignore, okay? But all young couples should watch this because within the space of an X number of weeks, they explode. They fight over the smallest, stupidest things. And I can actually see, it played out in my own marriage. Oh, we fought over the toilet seat, we fought over this. You look back, so stupid. Right? You, you, you then, right? All those white hair you know, right? <laughs> or oh, don't tell you, you never fight. I never fight, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Only we fight. And, and they were matched together uh, uh, at the wedding and they had never seen each other. And immediately Carolina looks at Dion and, and he says, Oh, yo, you'll be short. Uh. <laughs> Five foot seven. And you know what he said? Uh? He said, I'm very tall when I'm standing on my wallet. <laughs> he's, a yeah, he's a developer in Queensland. So he's standing on his wallet very tall. But it doesn't work out because all she can see is she's, he's five foot seven, he's not six feet. So the psychological bias in all of us, isn't it? We, we, out of fear, out of ignorance, out of bias, overgeneralization. And if you look at it, uh, if you look at someone, this is how it works. When you look at someone wearing that, the first thing you actually have is stereotype. 
We, we think about that person. Ah, that one. Ah, and then we feel. And then we act. So we think, all right, that this one is probably troublemaker. Come from this sort of country. They got suicide bombers, blah, blah, blah. Then you, when you think like that, right, then your feeling is affected. Your feeling will say, oh, I don't like. In my same office. Then after that, then you've got behavior. Uh, lunchtime, uh, uh, you eat yourself, I eat myself. I, I never invite that person back home. So thinking, feeling, and discrimination. And this happens to every single one of you. You don't tell me that you don't have discrimination. Even your Chinese towards the Malays, towards Indians, and Indians towards you. You all have stereotypical thinking. Stereotypical thinking, and then you've got prejudice, and then you behave. You look at a poor man sitting down there and just thinking, smelly, useless, lazy. Yeah, why do you think he's there, got no house? He didn't pay money for EPF, right? He must have gambled the money away. So that's what we think. And so therefore, we get angry. We feel, oh, angry, upset. You know, the fellow, God gave him all the chance, put him in the garden, he didn't. Somehow he winds up on the side of the road. And then you discriminate because you want to avoid him, put him at the back of the church. What if you see a refugee? What are the thinking? What is your thinking? Well, the poor, illegal, never apply for a visa, MH2, whatever, you know, because you got no money to apply for MH, Malaysia, my second home, right? Uninvited, he threatens my job because they come and take my job. So soon, all the Myanmar fellow will be chakwetiao too. Not only me chakwetiao, they also chakwetiao. And if you actually go to the corner shop, you see many of them chakwetiao already. Competition, they are a threat. And when you have that, then the feeling, bo song leo, angry, revulsion. You know, I, so long I'm in this country, you know, I'm like second class, third class, and somehow they come, I'm in fourth class now. And then you've got discrimination. You will avoid them, you put them at the back of the church. That's what happens. And then for some of you who are on the receiving end, maybe you're a refugee, maybe you're not quite so rich, you go for an interview, and you know the employer will be prejudiced against you, right? So he, when he interviews you, he raises his voice. He asks you difficult questions, right? And, and then you are lack of confidence. And when you lack of confidence and he grills you very hard, then you answer poorly. And when you answer poorly, then it confirms the prejudice of the boss. Ah, I see these people always like that one. <laughs> actually, this is stereotypes and self-fulfilling prophecy. We actually, you know, go down the spiral pathway all organized by society. So that's the problem when we become judges, when we should not become judges. So the basis of partiality is judgment. And the third point is very, very important. We are neither qualified nor entitled to judge people. That's a very important thing. I put a picture of a child as a judge. That's what you look like. You're never going to go to court and have a child as a judge until you die. <laughs> At least you'd have gone through law school, right? And, and, and grow some white hair. Uh, but here, have you not then made distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? The whole trust of this passage is among yourself. That means five of you. Is, I imagine I'm, I'm in working in my place in the hospital. We all stand around the operating theatre, the nurses, the anesthetists. Then we take a vote who's going to cut. Then the vote fell on the nurse. Oh, my turn to cut. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> this is how ridiculous it is cast. So James is being sarcastic. So we're unqualified also because of ulterior motive and we lack spiritual insight. So the poor person, whenever we see someone, we judge with reference to ourselves. What's in it for me? The rich person is better than me, so if I associate with him, Better status, ma. I look very good. The rich person, maybe after after the after I have an usher, I put him to a nice place. He come out, give me tip, you know. Oh, maybe got tip. No law in this church against tip tipping the ushers. Uh, the poor people come to you. You run the other way. You know, I ask for loan. 
Oh, contribute to his school. <laughs> Problem, isn't it? So therefore, you, you, you tend to run away from poor people. And for rich people, the English term is we become obsequious. You know obsequious is? Ah, you see, uh, uh, Kyung drive his big uh, Lamborghini car. Then he say, hey, can I park car for you? Uh? <laughs> huh? Can I do that? Uh? So that maybe he give you a tip. So for whenever a rich person does something, right, everybody has followed. That's why you see a lot of problems in our churches in this country is that rich people populate the church board. And when you populate the church board, the poor people have no chance to get the church board or become elders or whatever, then people always say yes to them simply because of their riches, not because of their spirituality. Because we're all judges. And that's wrong. Let me look at the basis of this. Matthew 5, 46 to 48 is very difficult. Uh, most difficult command in the entire scripture. You're supposed to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. How do you do that? It's virtual impossibility. How do you do that? But you will look at Jesus' reasoning, then you understand. And how you understand is if you look at this verse, it says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It comes in a context. And the context is very clear. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Huh? If you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, you become sons of your father. You understand in the Bible, the word sons is used in a different way in which we use sons. Sons today is based on DNA, biological. In those days, sons, the understanding of sons go beyond DNA. If you look at Nehemiah, sons of singers. You translate in NIV, musicians. So you come and speak to uh, Michelle afterwards, oh, you are a daughter of musicians, uh, da daughter of singers. I mean, she's a musician. Uh, sons of malice, wicked people. Uh, Job, sons of a flame, sparks. Right? Uh, sons of might, a mighty man, and in NIV is a fighter. Uh, sons of thunder, I would have translated bad-tempered people, but, <laughs> but you, you get the idea that the son is an exact replica of the father. And that's not appreciated today because we all have different uh, professions from our fathers. So basically what it says is that if you may be sons of your father, you, you love enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you become a perfect reflection of your father. So if your father is impartial and shows no favoritism, so you also must act like your father. And the example it gives you, he makes the sun rise up on the evil on the, and on the good, the rain, he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So when you're walking in Petaling Street, don't tell me the rain only falls on certain people, rain doesn't fall on you. He falls on both because the father is perfectly impartial and because you call yourself a Christian, then you must act the way he acts. And so therefore, if you look at God's love, theologically, there are four aspects of God's love. You've got God's providential love for the world, salvific love for people who do not know him yet, special love for his church, conditional church for his church, in terms of discipline. And if you look here, it is God's love for all people, which you must reflect if you are a Christian. It's actually the basis of the Geneva Convention. Do you know the Geneva Convention is a picture of a Canadian army hospital and they are treating, during this World War I, they are treating the Nazis, the German prisoners. It says, uh, you shall in all circumstances be treated humanely without any adverse distinction founded on race, colour, religion, faith, sex, birth, wealth, or any other similar criteria. This is the Geneva Convention. Uh, so, the question is, when you see someone asking for help, I think if you're asking who deserves help, is asking the wrong question. That is the problem. Imagine you have a family... And the mother goes out, play mahjong every day, and then go and shoot up heroin. And, it's, and you come and visit the, the, the house, and she you know, gives you a four-letter word and kicks you out. And the children are all starving. 
Now, you, you tell me which one you want to give money to. You probably give it to the children because they look very cute, right? Yeah, just like the old school, look very cute. But you ask me to give money to the father and mother who are pissing the money away and being irresponsible. It's very difficult, isn't it? Very, very difficult to do. And, and this whole problem infests us. We've got this myth of the deserving poor. If you look like those children I give you, you will look like the horrible mother I'm not going to give you. But is that the correct attitude? You see, like the rain falling on the just and the unjust. You know, it's about the rain. It's not on the, about the people whom the rain falls on top of. You may be just, you may be unjust, you may be a bad person, you may be a good person, but it's not about the person, it's about the rain. God sends the rain on the just and the unjust. It is the nature of grace. No one is worthy. Which brings me to that very famous passage which was preached before last year. The sheep and the goats, remember? For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, you welcomed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came with me. Look at this particular verse. What he's saying is that when you look at someone to give aid to, comfort to, to visit, the criteria is what? Hungry, thirsty, stranger, naked, sick, in prison. The criteria is not, hey, how you got to prison? Huh? Or those who cheat people, didn't pay tax, I visit you. Those who murder people, I won't visit you. There's no criteria there. The criteria is not the criteria we put. Is it legal? Are they deserving? Is this work giving money to the poor is a bottomless pit, you know? Keep on giving, giving, giving. Uh, attitude, ah, these people are not responsible. I give you money, the other day, and then spend on drugs. And then come and rob me, oh, you own my house. Oh, I put double security guard just because I give you money. You, you see, that unfortunately isn't how Jesus describes it. Jesus describes it as, look at this verse, the way I've crafted it, and you will see a pattern, isn't it? I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I, you, I, you, I, you. What has God done? God has put an interposition between the person who receives the gift between you and him by putting himself there. That's the difference. And so therefore, the key word is, and the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you? It's got to be so natural that you are actually unaware that you're actually helping people. That is your nature. And so therefore, you are actually responding to him. Proverbs says, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him. So if you lend the money to him, if you gave the money to him, and our friend went and gone and buy 15 tons of heroin, you cannot say, hey, my money wasted. Lah. Alama, I should have given to somebody else. I should have invested in the Zoe school, which I think you should. Right? But that's not the point. The, God puts himself in the middle of between the giver and the recipient and says you're responding to him. The money that you give out, you don't lose. You actually gain. It lends to the Lord. He will. You think, uh, I know you all don't like to lend money to people. You know why they never pay back? Then you look at the person's credit rating, whether it's triple A, double A, or junk bond. Right? You know what is the Lord rated at? Uh? Beyond triple A, isn't it? You think he won't pay you back? Proverbs say he will pay you back. You know, it depends on what kind of currency, okay? <laughs> He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food will supply and multiply your seed for growing, sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. So therefore, you are going to grow. And not only is he going to grow, he's going to give you the stuff to make you grow and grow in righteousness. So the right question is what? When you actually confront the poor, how can I best extend God's love to this person today? What action will be the most loving and transformational in this person's life. And it's going to vary from person to person, situation to situation. It's not going to mean that you walk down the streets of LA and everybody else is homeless and you give all your money to them and all that. It will depend on each situation. How can I best extend God's love to this person today? And in First Baptist Church, I'm very, very glad that some of you uh, have actually spent time every single week producing 
good meals, not Chekai meals, uh, good meals, which I would gladly eat and I'm now salivating over. And, and, and they do this all the time. And the question is asked to us, oh, you know, the, the, there'll be no end of poor. When do we stop? You never stop. When there's no more poor law? That's when you stop. You see, advice to the people who are rich. If you drive a car, you're rich already. Dare to do good. To be rich in good works, be generous and ready to share. Sharing, storing up a treasure for themselves as good foundation for the future so they may be, take hold of that which is truly life. Understand the real value in life. Godly generosity. That's what we need to do. How much would I give? Well, if the readiness, in Corinthians chapter 8, 12, if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. God doesn't expect you to sell your house and give everything away so you live at the side of the road and join them at the homeless. That's not what he said. He just said, according to what a person has. Okay? And then, chapter 8 uh, of Corinthians 2, I do not mean that others should be burdened, eased and you be burdened, but it's a matter of fairness. You hear the God of fairness, partiality, right? The principle of partiality is now being expressed by Paul. That the matter of fairness, that your abundance at the time should supply their need, their abundance should supply your need, that there may be fairness as written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, whoever gathered little had no lack. And that is taken from Exodus, it's taken from the time when they were in the Sinai Desert, where they got the mana fall down. You go and collect more mana, cannot be all the flies will get it the next day. It doesn't last. So everybody has enough to eat and drink. It doesn't mean they have to stay in the same kind of house. You stay in a bungalow, he stays in a flat. It doesn't matter. The, the bottom line is you've got enough to eat and be, have, have a shelter. So what is our temptation? Our temptation is to be the judge. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even tax collectors do the same? If you only greet your brothers, what more are you doing than the others? Don't even the Gentiles do the same. You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Uh, or if you only invite the people to dinner who are your friends, you only shake the hands of people, your friends, what's the difference between FPC and AMNO? We got election, they don't. So that's, that's probably the only difference. <laughs> so, transactional love is selfish love. We, we, people who affirm your status, people who add to your prestige, people who advance your position, people who make you feel good and look up to you. That's the problem with transactional love. So what's happening here is that they lack insight. So therefore, James tells them, listen. That's an imperative. Listen. All right? Judges, ushers are not judges. The poor in the background of the Old Testament, either the materially poor or spiritually poor, they're in both Hebrew and Greek, the concept is the same. Often the people who are materially poor are also spiritually poor. They recognize their need. Luke chapter 6, the Beatitude by Luke says, Blessed of those who are are you who are poor, materially poor. And Matthew says those who are poor in spirit. Okay? Now, if you look at the whole book of James, the entire book about James is about people who are deceived. And he's saying, all of you cannot gone. You are all deceived. Right? He's saying, don't be deceived. My brethren, every good gift comes from heaven, so therefore, deceive about God's character. Don't be, be doers of the word and not hearers of the word, only deceiving yourself. We deceive self and only hearing and not acting. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his heart. See, deceived. So the whole focus is deceived. We are deceived. Our deception is self-deception, but it means the person who is rich, I'm good, that's why I'm rich. I'm talented, I have power, I can make things happen, I'm in control. The poor person is lazy, useless, has got no talent. And this all comes from the myth of the self-made man. You are what you are because you study hard in school, right? They all play football in the field, but I study very hard, I got 10 A's, they got zero. That's the common thinking in our brain. So therefore, whatever I get, I deserve, isn't it? I live in a mansion, you live in a hole, I deserve it because I work hard, you play football. Uh, mother called you to, to study, you don't study. That's what our parents used to teach us. 
But in real life, poverty is a primary fact of human existence. You know, when you're born, we're all born beggars. The first thing you do when they slap you, they say, ah, I want milk. You're begging all the time. Every time I bug the, the, your mother day and night, ah, you know, because you, you need to be fed. Birth is a gift. You have to be nurtured, your parents, you'll be taught your language. Who teaches you your language? Your mother and father. Who teaches you morals? Your mother and your father. So we are actually all poor. Rich people, the only problem with rich people, they forgot. They thought they were self-made men. And they're blind. Look, warns and take care, be on your guard against all covetousness for life. One's life does not consist in abundance of his possession. There was an article written in the Forbes. Five most common regrets of billionaires. Nowadays, billionaire doesn't cut it. <laughs> it's got to be billionaires. The first regret, not jumping on greater opportunities, probably make more money. Not living in the present. Not starting soon enough. Not being bolder. Not changing fast enough. Mistakes and failures are necessary. Can you see that? Complete blindness. Complete inability to, be, to have insight in where they actually are. That's why Jesus said the rich be coming to heaven very hard, isn't it? Worse than a camel going through the eye of a needle. And there's a reason why God chooses the poor. Is God unfair? God says, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which you have promised those who love him? That's the reason. You know why? There's only one currency that the Lord God recognizes. It's faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. When you walk through the door, God's not going to look at what you wear or the gold ring. He's going to look at whether you believe and whether you trust him. So misplaced honor is that the ushers have given honor to the wrong person. In fact, Jonathan Edwards has very insightful words which I really found transformational for myself. He actually says, deliberately choose the poor. Don't wait for the poor to come to us. It actually insults them. If you were in that position, how would you like it to be treated? You see, trouble is we are rich. We always wonder, poor, you want money, you want help, you must come to me, kowta before me, or being obsequious. What he's actually saying, because you are sons of God, you should actually deliberately go to the poor, not wait for the poor to come to you. You got it all wrong. You're going to wait for the Zo people to come and tell you how terrible the situation is. Only $200 a, uh, a year for one child, and then maybe you open your purse screen for a little while, next day you go off and drive off in your Lexus. You should make it a mission. You should make it your calling to reach out to the poor and don't let them suffer the indignity come crawling to you. And that is a huge revelation to us because God is a God of partiality. Not a no, God of partiality. He's a God who is fair and He loves them. Take a look at this picture. If you want to treat everybody equally, the short guy, oh, gone already. What happened? My one gone. Okay. The short guy is you give him the same amount of money as the rich man and all that, he's always going to be a disadvantage, right? So what you actually have to do is push him up so he can see the football field. That's what we want. We want equity. That the poor be given an opportunity in life. And it's such a pathetic thing that we have refugees in our midst who are human beings made in the image of God that they have to come and beg you for the 200 bucks so that they could actually learn something. And we walk away, oh nice, Pastor Kai, bye-bye. We can't be people like that. Because if we are people like that, then we better not come to church. This, that's why James is hard-hitting. It hits us where it counts. If you really believe that you are a son of God, then you start acting as one. God deliberately chooses the poor. You have dishonored the poor because you never chose the poor. If, because the poor are the ones who are short. You come and you lift them up. 
God lifts them up. If you don't lift them up, then you have dishonored the poor. So, and God says, in Corinthians, God chose what is weak in the world to shame the poor. Because often the poor understand the need for God. The rich do not. It highlights God's His power and condemns man's pride. Have you dishonored the poor? Are not the rich the ones who oppress you? The ones who drag you to court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? You see, the trouble is you judge and you treat the rich better and the poor bad and you thought it benefited you. Actually, no. You tell me the poor fellow can come and sue you. Nobody can, only the rich can sue you. There's a story told of a local church where uh, um, a lady in BSF was asked to cater a meal for this family, rich family. And then, and then as she was catering the meal at home and cooking, and the fellas, the, the wife keep on coming into the kitchen saying, this one no good, that one no good. By the time finished, the, the meal is three hours later on and the food is cold. And the family were very upset with this lady from BSF, who is the caterer. You know what they did? They went outside, probably to Grand Imperial, order the ribs, racked up a $16,000 bill and gave the bill to the caterer. Yeah, it's a true story told to me by one of the people suffering. So don't cater to rich people. They're going to sue you. This is Elon Musk, richest man in the world. They love him so much. He bought Twitter. First thing he did was sack 80% of the people. 80% of people, just like numbers, just sack the whole lot of them. Uh, he even fired the head of sales after she refused, refused to sack more employees. And then after that, oops, I made a mistake. Important to admit when I'm wrong, and firing him was truly one of my biggest mistakes. The problem isn't his mistake. The problem is he treated people like objects, like numbers on a spreadsheet. That's what rich people do. When we, when we rich person look at you uh, and smile at you, I think you better be very careful. <laughs> because he will think, kaching, kaching, kaching. Ah, maybe I can get something out of this man. Because that's the way he thinks. That's the way most businessmen think, if you are honest. It's a bottom line. You doesn't help my bottom line. Buy, buy low. You either take from me or I have to give to you. You see, and we are now praising and honoring the wrong people. If a rich people smile, you better run. Please run and to save your life. The last point before I end is we need to see ourselves in the light of Christ. And, and, and that's a crucial first verse. It says, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord. Why does he say Lord of glory? If you're a Christian, you're holding faith in Jesus. He could have said, you shouldn't show any partiality because you are holding faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jacob, right? He says Lord of glory, you know. And, and the point here is that our behavior is a result of our being. So if we are showing no partiality, it's because we have faith in our Lord Jesus, the Lord of glory. Glory in the Old Testament is kavod, which is basically weight, worth, value, and it results in praise. You can see that phenomenon shown in the, the, in the cloud, the daytime, and the fire at night. And, and, and at the lowest point of Moses' life, where the people of God were nearly wiped out because of the golden calf issue. And God said, yeah, I had enough of these people. I'm going to wipe them all out. I'm only choosing you. You are my new Abraham. No, he said, no, 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 no. He was willing to offer his life up. At the worst part of his life, Moses said, show me your glory. Because only the glory of God will sustain him. Because he's hungering for glory. We are all hunger for glory. If you look at uh, Ernest Becker, who wrote this uh, a uh, uh, seminal Pulitzer Prize winning novel uh, book uh, in 1960s, The Denial of Death. He says, man is literally split into two. He has an awareness of his own splendid uniqueness and that he sticks out of nature with a towering majesty. And yet he goes back into the ground a few feet in order to blindly and dumbly rot and disappear forever. 
it's terrifying dilemma to be in and to have to live with. You see, our human dilemma, you drill it right down to everybody on the face of the earth, is that we are majestic, we do wonderful things, and yet in the end, you die and you become food for worms. That's a problem. And every single person in this room and in this world have to deal with this. How do we deal with it? Well, he says, the real world is simply too terrible to admit. It tells man that he's small, a trembling animal who will some way someday die and decay. Culture changes all of this, makes men seem important, vital to the universe, immortal in some ways. Ernest Becker has got it correct. We face this dilemma. How do we act in this dilemma? Well, we, we compensate by culture, changing our culture so that we get some of the glory that will last forever. So therefore, we spread our wings, we win all the Olympic gold medals that we want, but that hunger never ends, even after how many Olympics? In fact, if we don't have glory, we borrow other people's glory. That's why you go around, take wifey, you know? Does anybody take selfie with you or wifey with you? <laughs> right? If you take with you, means they want your glory. Lah. Then you say, don't take with me. <laughs> right? Because they want some of your glory. And even celebrities need glory from each other. Because we're not seeking glory from God, we're seeking glory from each other, isn't it? And, and that's a whole basis of marketing. If you look at this uh, dress, yellow dress by, uh, what's her name? Kate, I think. Yeah, right. Okay, 95% you know, rise in dress sales after the royal tour in Australia 2014. And this other hand, I don't know, black and white kind of dress, right? Uh, also, within eight minutes. Why? Because people want to borrow her glory. If I wear a yellow dress, I'm Princess Kate. It's just stupid, isn't it? You, you all laugh, isn't it? But tell me why you wear these sort of pants. <laughs> tell me who's got a torn jeans. Put your hands up. Ah, you see? When I was growing up, if I had a torn jeans, I dare not go to school. People look at me, Peter, you poor man. You know. No money to sew your pants up. And now people like you are all buying clothes that are torn. Till this day, I will never understand it. The next day, I'm going to sell you a load of, uh, instead of laksa, today go uh, laksa, I'm going to sell you a bowl of shit. And because Justin Bezer ate the shit, you will eat it too. It's because our hunger for glory. We don't have the glory. So we're always seeking it from whether the cars we drive, the women we date, or the houses we live in, whether we want to explore in space. Or whether 97 years old, you still want to fight your election, I don't understand. <laughs> but Ernest Becker tells us why. Animals don't have it. They only desire to makan and eat the next day. Tan chia, chia chikang. Human beings have this dilemma. And Moses' request was fully granted in Jesus Christ. When he came to our lives, Brothers and sisters, there's only one source of glory. You don't get it in the torn pants. You don't get it in the yellow dress. You don't get it in the Lexus. You get it in our Lord Jesus Christ and you already have it. If you already have it, please act and live as if you have it. And the most important event was that the richest person on the face of this universe he gave up all his riches and he came down. And that's the reason why if you reach into your pockets right now, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Can I have the musicians up here? This bread and this wine represent the richest gift that we will ever receive in our entire lives. This bread and this wine 
will change the way you look at other people, will change the way you look at yourself. And I'm serious. When I was growing up as a child, I was most proud. We live in a good neighborhood, in a bungalow. My father was the assistant director of the meteorological department of Malaysia, one of the few graduates at the time in the 60s. We were, I had toys for Christmas. We had to drive a Volvo in those days, one, two, two. Oh, Volvo, very big deal in those days. And then at the age of 40, my father died of a heart attack. And we were plunged into poverty. My brother, no skills. In our whole bungalow, we live in one room. We rented all the rooms, and my mother used to cry every night and sew clothes. So I know what it's like to be poor. Because children are, un are merciless to you. And I was a child at the time, about eight, about eight, nine, ten years old. And we lived in the neighborhood where they got ambassadors, sons, and all that. And they would, I, I felt, in fact, ten foot tall, I felt like a microbe. And that feeling has been with me ever since. And I actually studied hard, went to medical school, and, and did all that because I still feel small inside. So I can hold my head high when I walk next to people like that again. And do you know that kind of feeling never goes away? You can be rich and still feel poor until I met Jesus Christ. And He makes you 10 feet tall. That's the only glory that will last beyond the day when your skills are gone and your mind is gone and your family is gone and your riches are gone. Brothers and sisters, this is the greatest gift that anyone can give you. They give you their lives. So let's take the bread out. Before we take it, let's take a moment and I want you to reflect how do you look at yourself today? Where is your glory? And then I want you to look at this bread. And then when you take it, you take it in faith. Let's just take a minute to think as the worship team plays the music. Let's take what He has given us. This is my body given up for you. Let's take it together. Let's prepare the wine. When we take His body, when we take His blood, we can now stand tall, side by side, with kings and priests and princes anywhere in the world, white, yellow, black, it doesn't matter, because the color of our lives is red. It's the blood of Christ. That's the color of my skin. That's the color of my eyes. And that's the color of my life. If it's true for you, let's take it together now. We have this closing song and then I'll pray. Church, let us uh, stand as we respond with this closing song.
I'm going to invite Pastor Kai to give the benediction for us. Pastor Kai, can you come up here? I'm going to pray and then you will give the benediction. Father Lord, we just thank you that in you we stand tall. In you, you are the Lord of glory. And we pray that we go out in the world this day. We will live as people who believe and trust that you are our glory. We ask for Jesus' sake. And Pastor Kai will give the benediction. Now, may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight brought Jesus Christ uh, through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.
and uh, Pastor Kai will be staying back. For any one of you who need prayers, please stay back. The elders will be in front. Together with Pastor Kai, let us pray over you. God bless all of you and have a great week ahead.